So good evening, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Meredith Clayton. I am the Associate Director of our Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies. Um, the honor of introducing our guest speaker falls to me because the faculty member who invited David has a family emergency and cannot be here. However, it is my responsibility to thank the Frankie Institute for the Humanities for hosting us, my colleague Esther Peters for helping to run and video record this event, and Kinga Kosmala in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures for the inspiration to bring David Ost to Chicago. David Ost is the Joseph DeGangi Professor of Political Science at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and a frequent visiting professor in Eastern Europe. He has written widely on Eastern European politics and society with a focus on political economy, democratization, capitalism, and labor. Professor Ost is the author of several books on communist and post-communist society, including The Defeat of Solidarity, Anger and Politics in Post-Communist Society, which received the Ed Hewitt Award for Best Book in Political Economy, and which, after being published in Polish translation in 2007, played a significant role in Polish political debates. His essays have been published in numerous scholarly and popular journals, such as Politics and Society, European Journal of Social Theory, Theory and Society, East European Politics and Society, European Journal of Industrial Relations, The Nation, Dissent, Telos, and Tukun. And he has served on the editorial boards of several of these journals. Among many distinctions and honors, including being selected member of the Fulbright Specialist Program for Political Science, and a senior fellow at the Cornell Institute for European Studies, in 2005, David Ost received the former Polish president, Lech Walesa, a special medal, medal issued for the 25th anniversary of Solidarity. Professor Ost has been busy writing and speaking extensively these past several months on Hungarian and Polish new right and power, and we are delighted to welcome him here today to give a timely and important lecture on why Poland matters, East European lessons in the time of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meredith, for the invitation, and thank you all for coming. I thank Kinga Kozmala. I'm sorry she can't be here, but uh, uh, hopefully she'll be able to see the video. So thank you, too, Kinga. Um, why Poland matters, East European lessons for the time of Trump. Now, let me begin by saying in the last 40 years, we could say there have been two times, two periods in which Poland has been uh, at the center of world interest. And of course, the first time was during the 1980s, starting in 1980, with the um, emergence of the Solidarity Movement. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that, this spectacular movement, trade union movement, so, so, uh, trade union, social movement, quasi-national uprising, uh, peaceful, s seeking peaceful transformation of the system that began in 1980, saw a spectacular unity between different social groups in Poland. Uh, and even though, and even after the movement was repressed severely in December 1981, persevered during the 1980s um, and uh, finally got its way until 1989, where in Poland w there was the first transformation, the first regime change, we could say, from the communist system towards a new type of democratic system and capitalist and neoliberal system, which was not talked about much, but which is also important for understanding um, development since then. So of course, uh, uh, the leader of that movement, like Wałęsa, won the Nobel Prize in 1983. Uh, soon after, soon after uh, uh, 1989, he was one of the first foreign speakers who spoke before a joint session of Congress. Um, and so it was a movement that really transformed much of the world. Of course, the uh, uh, p change in Polish government happened about six months before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So it's been central um, uh, for so many reasons back in the 1980s. Now, the second time Poland has emerged uh, close to center of world interest has been very recently. Um, in fall, 2015, with the coming to power of the Law and Justice Party, led by uh, uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski, uh, who, um, and, uh, um, which came to power in 2015 uh, and promptly set in motion what could also be called regime change, moving away from the, from the institutions of liberal democracy, uh, transforming uh, the institutions of judiciary, uh, of media, civil service, calling for a strong state, 
uh, and and uh, and evoking in the in the um, evoking, by the way, and in the process, a very strong movement opposing. Uh, and so Poland in some way follows, uh, this 2015 movement follows from what had happened in Hungary a few years earlier when Fidesz came to power uh, and, and, and set about doing many of the same kinds of uh, uh, changes, political transformations that were in Poland. But Poland, I think, brought it, Poland began making it more of a model, right? Poland learned a lot from Hungary, and Poland is about four times the size of Hungary, playing a much more central role in the European Union. And so since that time, uh, it's been uh, very much followed, and I think being, being followed by uh, others, including others in the uh, new right elsewhere who want to, who want to uh, uh, follow in that footstep. So what I'm going to do in this talk is first talk a bit about what's been going on in Poland, what kind of policies were introduced. Um, talk about what it means, what the significance is, connect it with uh, traditions of, uh, political traditions that uh, 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 are not often connected to it, uh, or at least connected to political traditions that they don't talk about, but I think are central for it, and in the process also be discu discussing various, various connections and comparisons with developments in the United States. So first, what are they doing? Well, they came to power in 2015 uh, promoting a program, their slogan in the campaign slogan uh, for fall of 2015 was Dobra Zmiana, a good change. They're calling for uh, just to move in ways that are going to help the population in all ways. Many of the radical stances that they were known for, that Kaczynski was known for uh, previously, they put on hold during the campaign, and we're just trying to make things better. We're very sympathetic to the common people, uh, and, and uh, uh, we just want to make things better. Um, and uh, soon after coming to power, uh, they initiated a, a policy that many thought was very strange at the time, um, but it seems to be actually central to their mission. So in other words, within a few weeks after coming to power, even before the Constitutional Court, the equivalent of our Supreme Court, really, the, the only body that is uh, allowed by the Constitution to declare some laws unconstitutional, um, so even before this constitutional court could rule on any of their legislation and proposals, uh, peace, as I'll refer to the party, the Law and Justice Party, using his Polish initials, peace, P-I-S, uh, peace uh, set about trying to marginalize the constitutional court, strip it of its possibilities to rule laws unconstitutional. So it passed a series of bills, there was a, provoked a conflict over the nomination of judges, and then quickly, uh, quickly, in the course of one day, voting at 2 a.m., uh, passed a law that restricted the possibilities of the Constitutional Court to uh, rule on legislation. Now, as a law dealing with the Constitution, this naturally felt fell to that same Constitutional Court to rule on this uh, law, and the Constitutional Court said that the court, uh, said that Parliament had, uh, that this ruling was unconstitutional, uh, and that it didn't meet any of the provisions of the Constitution. Now, um, Peace responded by saying that the court did not have a right to make such a ruling since we passed a law changing it, uh, and they said they would not honor it. Now, in the Polish Constitution of Article 190, cannot be more clear, uh, judgments of the Constitutional Court shall be universally binding and shall be final. So how did peace get around that? Everyone says, well, Constitutional Court rules this, this is in the Constitution. So in many ways, even more significant than the law itself was the justification that Kaczynski, the Prime Minister, and the President began using namely saying that the court uh, had no right to do so uh, and that they had a right to overrule the court because they, peace, had just won national elections. Uh, and so their view 
was more in line with the views of the nation, I'll put that in quotes, we'll be coming back to that very often, this concept of the nation is very central. So they said, right, our, since we won the election, our views, our policies, we are more in line with the views of the nation than a court made up of judges appointed in the past. So on the basis of having been elected, and uh, they got 37% of the vote in the, in the elections, uh, but because of the electoral system that translated into little more, a little more than 50% of the votes. So they said, we have a majority, and so we can overrule them. Again, it, it very significant and, and, and uh, you know, they're just asserting their power, we represent the nation. It's one of, one of very many ways, incidentally, in which for all of its anti-communism, uh, peace justifications have a lot in common uh, with the justifications used by the uh, Polish Communist Party, the Polish U United Workers Party uh, uh, in the late 1940s when, uh, uh, when the communists took power. One of their close allies in parliament made this bold statement that elicited a standing ovation of peace supporters, namely, any law that is contrary to the interests of the nation is lawlessness. Right. So, uh, who has the right to determine what is in the interest of the nation? Well, those that had won election and those that have represented the interests of the nation. Of course, that's a logic that peace had uh, consistently denied previous governments. Um, the previous governments, of course, didn't make that claim. But, um, but, let's see. Ah, sorry, I don't know if I clicked something here, but. Um, in any case, yeah. Anyway, peace, peace hadn't made that claim. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the previous governments hadn't made that claim. Uh, and uh, uh, this, in any case, was the, was the, claim, that, the claim that peace made. Um, OK, well, the government then said, peace then said, it will recognize only those rulings of the court that, uh, that it chose to. Uh, and that uh, when the court started making other decisions after that, uh, they simply uh, explained that, well, the Constitutional Court is a group of colleagues meeting on their own. Huh. It's all right. Yeah, anyway, they said this is a, a colleagues meeting on their own, and we don't need to take their vote seriously. Now, I might, I might add that, um, this issue about the Constitutional Court, I mean, right now the court has been, sorry, should we take a moment here? Did, did, oh, I might have kicked that out. I said I wouldn't do it. Okay, well, I'll continue. I don't have a slide for a few minutes anyway. Um, so uh, I might add that this issue concerning the judiciary it's actually a major issue right now as we speak. So in the last few days, uh, Peace has proposed, is setting its sights not just on the Constitutional Court, thank you, but on the judiciary as a whole. So uh, they're proposing wholesale changes in how the judiciary is appointed uh, in the future. Up to now, there's been a National Judicial Advisory Council made up of judges and lawyers, which has a role in vetting candidates for professional qualifications, and right now there's a bill which probably will be passed in the next coming days, um, uh, dissolving this current council in its form and giving parliament and the president sole authority uh, uh, to um, appoint the members of this committee and to appoint the judiciary. There's talk that they may do something that the Hungarians did, namely uh, in Hungary they soon passed the law having a lot of judges opposed to them, saying that any judge who's over 65 years old, you've worked hard enough, you deserve retirement, so we'll force you into retirement, uh, and they freed up a lot of positions to appoint, um, to appoint their own people. Um, so in this way, the impact, of course, will be a more uh, a, a complete politicization of the judiciary with political credentials and uh, not judicial credentials being necessary um, for judgeship. What are some other factors? Well, media law. The media law, along with the court law, was passed in a blizzard of legislation, uh, systemic, transforming legislation that was passed 
between Christmas and New Year's in 2015, uh, usually voted on very late at night, two in the morning. There was so much legislation that parliamentarians on all sides says, you know, we don't even have a chance to read this legislation before, before we vote on it. Um, so uh, one of those was uh, transforming the uh, control of the media. Right now, private media is still off limits. Uh, but the public media, the ones owned by the state, uh, they passed this law giving the party f complete control over this. So it's explicit party control. They alone uh, appoint all the uh, directors, appoint the programming, have wide, wide, wide uh, uh, leeway in terms of what is going to be promoted and put there. Uh, and so public media, television, radio, uh, is is um, state media is now entirely in their hands and they're using it to promote their line and besmirch the opposition. For example, about two days after they passed this law, I was watching the um, the new national news and it was the day that the Committee to Defend Democracy, KOD, had held a big rally protesting this. So the news had about a half a second uh, uh, shot of the demonstrators, and then the next 15 seconds or so with a comment of someone across the street, something totally unsubstantiated, and there's been no evidence of anything like it, where this person across the street says, oh yeah, I was watching and there were, uh, there were officials coming and paying everyone 300 zwati, about $100 at the time, uh, to participate in that, right? No evidence, total not true, but simply presented on the national news as, um, as the truth. Um, and the height of the using the public media uh, to uh, uh, deal with issues of the opposition came just a month ago. So in December, two months ago, in December 2016, uh, there was a big uh, protest be, uh, by parliamentarians because the Speaker of the House uh, ejected, uh, dismissed, told a opposition deputy that he could no longer speak uh, about this issue. He raised something that the Speaker ruled out of order. Uh, he had, uh, according to normal parliamentary rules, had no right to do so, ejected him, at which, at which time the opposition then stood up and, and went to the podium and said, we're not going to leave. Uh, so trying to defend uh, its rights that have been marginalized in ways, other ways that I'll talk about in a moment. In any case, it was a very firm, determined protest, which lasted for a while, and the media then last, um, last month did a 30-minute documentary uh, as they announced on TV. We're going to have this film, Pooch, there's the, the German word meaning coup d'etat. Uh, today on national TV, watch this documentary on the occupation of parliament. Uh, this was uh, a 30-minute documentary presented just after the national news in which the entirety of their protest uh, was reduced simply to the opposition is was planning and is planning to stage a coup d'etat and to overthrow the government. Uh, again, simply presented without any counter, uh, countering views, uh, having nothing to do with the truth, uh, but nevertheless, right, a 30-minute documentary and, uh, um, you know, setting the stage for that the opposition is not really an opposition, but they are traitors. Um, okay, a third aspect is politicization of the civil service. So whereas previous laws had put in place that to be uh, head deputies and have important positions in civil service, many of the positions, you needed professional qualifications, uh, uh, you needed not to be a member of political party, there needed to be a contest competition for who's going to be elected, uh, selected uh, for this post, and this, position, this person would serve for a set uh, limit. So all of these aspects to try to preserve independence and state qualifications. So one of the laws also passed during the blizzard of legislation uh, was to revoke every single one of those policies. So no professional qualifications are necessary. If you have them, great, but not necessary. Um, membership in political party is very much allowed, not obligatory, but allowed. Uh, no open search, uh, no contest required, and uh, revocable at any 
at any point. Um, so, uh, you know, this is already something that connects to uh, uh, some developments in the Trump administration. As we know, the, one of the few um, uh, cabinet members not yet appointed is the head of the EPA, Environmental Protection uh, Agency. And, uh, you know, he has an entire record of wanting to erode that industry, uh, uh, that agency, and uh, he's been an industry representative. So there have been some protests within the EPA of how can we have a leader who wants to, you know, who's against everything we're doing. And since there was that protest, some of Trump's uh, 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 colleagues have been saying perhaps we have to revisit the civil service law and those people who are protesting get rid of them as well. So this aspect of political Criticizing the civil service is something that's being done there and um, carried through elsewhere. So, um, fourth development, uh, surveillance without warrants uh, expanded uh, widely. Uh, and uh, limiting rights of protest. So, for example, it's still possible to make demonstrations, uh, but a new law says that if a state institution wants to hold a rally uh, at the same point uh, at, at one place, then it, it gets priority. So, for example, if opposition group says we want to hold a rally at this point, uh, the state agency can say, well, we want to hold something at that point, and so you cannot because we have, we have done so. Um, transformation of parliamentary rules. I alluded to this in the discussion about the uh, occupation and the, uh, the, the, the film Pooch. Um, but what kind of things have been done there? Well, soon after coming to office, they restricted rights of, um, uh, the, the rights of opposition to participate in all parliamentary committees. Uh, so that was revoked soon after. Um, there's uh, no ability to get questions answered. Uh, by candidates. So what I mean by this is, for example, uh, when the piece did appoint new constitutional judges uh, to the constitutional court, because it hasn't totally eliminated the agency, it's just eviscerated it, so it's appointed its own people there, and as it appointed people, it did, there was room in the parliament for uh, questions. So opposition delegates stood up and said, uh, sir, madam, what do you think of these issues? Is it your line that peace should be able to do this, that the government should do this? What are your questions? What are your issues of judicial philosophy? The kind of things we're used to and we will soon see with the Supreme Court hearing here. So what happened is for about an hour, there was total ability of the opposition to ask these questions. When the hour was finished, the, parliament, the Speaker of the House said, thank you very much for your questions. Now we will proceed to a vote. Uh, and so the vote happened a minute later, all the people were uh, uh, confirmed and no one had to answer the question. So, so there was no, you know, no give and take, simply ask the questions and nothing um, about that. Um, also, bills, how, uh, how bills are proposed. When bills are proposed by political parties, as they normally are, then th the law requires that they go through uh, social um, consultation. Various groups in and outside of government uh, have a right to comment on uh, those laws. But what they've begun doing, they did this in Hungary as well, is there's a tiny loophole saying if an individual deputy proposes a law, then it doesn't require any social consultation. So basically every law, uh, including the one on the judiciary I mentioned now, are, are, are uh, ostensibly put forth by individual deputies, not subject to any kind of rule on parliamentary, uh, uh, on social commentary. Um, and so they smuggle it in this way. Uh, okay, let's talk about cultural transformations. First of all, there's the, this declaration of a new beginning. In 1989, as we all know, the uh, Communist Party gave up power, the state socialist system ended, uh, uh, and uh, there was a regime change in 1989. Well, not completely, according to Peace. So in 2015, when they won, they say, this is finally the time that communism has ended uh, and that we were governed by post-communism and, 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 and various kinds of deals. So we haven't really been free until 2015. Uh, we can find allusions of this in Donald Trump's statement in the, uh, his inauguration that January 20th is the day that the people 
became rulers of this nation again. Uh, so this idea of a new beginning, very common to revolutionaries, uh, is, is, is something that we see playing out here. Um, one of the other aspects in cultural policy is uh, uh, what they call historical politics. So what we teach in schools. They denounce previous governments for saying that they promote a pedagogy of shame, uh, where they teach people some of the problematic and bad things that uh, Poland has done. So their position is that we have to change that. This is a series uh, 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 right, of, of, of dates about heroic battles that the Poles have made over history. Uh, and so uh, there's a big focus. The education curriculum has been changed. Much more focus on teaching good aspects of Poland and not, uh, and not um, no real criticism allowed. Now, interestingly, they make one major uh, exception for the one figure that is more widely known, the one Polish figure outside of the Pope, uh, more widely known in the world than um, anyone else, namely Lech Wałęsa. Wałęsa, the leader of the Solidarity Movement in 1980, Nobel Prize winner in 1983, president of Poland afterwards, the unquestioned leader of Solidarity, except that now he is the questioned leader. So Peace and its supporters and its house historians have been making a, a, a campaign, again, very contrary to what they say, let's promote these good stories. So they take their own good story of that, that, that is known everywhere in the world uh, and say, be, using the fact that for a couple of years as a young man when in his 20s, when he got involved in a, a strike and was repressed by that strike for about two years, uh, he gave reports to the secret police, right? He was blackmailed by the secret police for about two years in the early 70s. Uh, he wrote some reports. Then he broke with them, and of course, that experience led him to be even more of an oppositionist than before, led the Solidarity Movement, um, but the entire story one hears from uh, 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 the government now uh, is that uh, he was simply an agent uh, and, um, uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski is trying to promote the idea that his brother, Lech Kaczynski, who died in the Smolensk plane crash, was the real you know, uh, 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 leader of that time. Um, there's also drastic um, delegitimation of opponents and calls to violence against them, similar to Trump's calls in the campaign about uh, uh, you know, beating up these protesters. So here is a uh, site by a, 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 a pro-peace media outlet. This is a picture of uh, uh, how police were, cra were arresting, beating up anarchist protesters in the inauguration of Donald Trump. Several of them, have, uh, even journalists, have felony charges against them. And this says, look at how the American police deals with American oppositionists. We have to take this example, right? So we're not being hard enough on the opposition, um, allowing them to um, uh, uh, protest so much. Uh, there's also co major cultural transformations in terms of uh, gender, reversing uh, any kinds of uh, uh, awareness of gender issues, of uh, uh, violence against women. This new government is now uh, backing out of the treaty in the European Union against domestic violence, saying that uh, uh, this is an attempt to break up the Polish family. And it even has some more, I don't know, comical or strange manifestations um, with this uh, with this picture. So uh, in a, a group connected to the education agency in trying to prepare students for the major high school exams sent around this picture with a question for students was, what is wrong with this picture? Anyone guess what's wrong with this picture? What's a father doing taking care of a baby? That's what moms are supposed to do. What is the mom doing if the father is doing this? Uh, so too much nurturing by the father, uh, that's the kind of thing that, uh, uh, according to them, gender advocates propose. Uh, we don't want any part of that. So as it says, right, this is not, um, this is not a traditional family. 
Um, so there's been a real turn towards the more extreme aspects uh, uh, of the Catholic Church as well, uh, and in fact, um, church has been getting a lot of official state money, something that hadn't been done to that level in the past. There's also uh, unalloyed anti-Islamism, somewhat surprising given the lack of uh, uh, Muslims in the country. So this is an infamous port uh, cover of a, uh, 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 one of Peace's most loyal journals. Uh, it says, The Islamic Rape of Europe. And of course, there's a white woman being molested by dark hands, uh, and uh, that is the, um, yeah, that's what, so, so there's this kind of anti-Islamism. Uh, anti uh, there have been many instances of people being beaten up on the streets. When that happens, peace does not condemn it, does not condone it, it literally makes sure there's a, a blaringly loud silence. It says nothing about any of those aspects. Okay, so you have many aspects of the kinds of things that it's doing in politics. At the same time, there are a whole host of other aspects that it's doing, namely that uh, they they promoted a whole kind of new social programs uh, that have uh, uh, that have changed, moved away from the neoliberalism of the past in a radically new direction. So one of the first uh, uh, this they did in early 2016 to have a benefit 500 called 500 plus 500 zwatis given to the parents of uh, uh, every of children under 18 every second child and everyone after that 500 zwatis for their upkeep which is about 125 130 dollars which is quite significant uh, uh, in in uh, uh, Polish uh, given. Polish wages. If there's a family of four, they get 1,500 zwati a month uh, until uh, for each child under 18. Uh, and it's had a very big impact. Already in a year, it's drastically reduced uh, levels of child poverty. Uh, it's also had an effect on the labor market as well because people, uh, low wage workers, uh, are less willing to work for very low wages because they have this benefit for child care. So it's had an effect on boosting wages. So it's had a real important impact there. They've also taken some rules to uh, limit the temporary contracts that are uh, very popular there. That is, Poland talked about you know, Poland in 1989 made this transformation to a new system right at the moment when there was a global uh, uh, heyday of neoliberalism, meaning going back to absolute market control, individualism, limit social policy, et cetera, right? So one of the consequences in Poland is that Poland uh, in the last years is the number one leader, if you call it leader, uh, in terms of having what in Poland they call junk contracts, short-term contracts, easy hiring and firing, no job stability. The, late, the last government started taking some action against that, um, but uh, 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 peace has been more you know, um, cracking down on this and uh, uh, passing, passing legislation to make those uh, short-term contracts more long-term. Um, they've also put forth a, um, a bank ta tax on banks and financial institutions to many domestic banks and all branches of foreign banks and insurance companies. This is raising a lot of money per year to pay for these social programs. Um, uh, so what we see here is a number of social policies that there's no question if they had been put forth by, by parties such as Podemos, by kind of uh, uh, radical left parties or social democratic left parties like, like Podemos in Spain, like uh, Syriza, if they were proposed by a, a, a possible Bernie Sanders administration, right? There was no question they would be heralded as the kinds of things, the kinds of uh, bold social activity, uh, a government policy that could be done to aid those who have been, um, who, who have been, un, uh, uh, who have been jettisoned and marginalized by policies of the past. Um, so we have this combination, right, eviscerating checks on power, uh, government control of media and bureaucracy, limits of opposition, clamp down on civil society, on NGOs. Um, 
uh, restoration of traditional gender norms at the same time that you have policies moving towards economic inclusion like this. So how to make sense of this? Is it a contradiction that they're doing these things associated with the right and these things associated with the left? Well, not really. It's not really a contradiction. Uh, that is, combining these two aspects is a tendency, is, is, is part of a political tendency that was once quite popular uh, and, and uh, uh, strong in the Western tradition in the early up to the mid 20th century, but one that has uh, 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 declined very since then. That is an aspect, a, a, a tradition that at the same time expressed both the desire to make life better uh, for those belonging to the nation, uh, combined with the rejection of checks on power, fear and hostility uh, to those not of our nation, and uh, uh, support for uh, authoritarian politics in the form of uh, a leader who a uh, strong executive power for determining, shaping policy on their own. That tradition, of course, is the uh, classic fascist tradition, right? So um, now, uh, talking about that, of course, you know, that's come up a lot in Poland. Of course, it's come up so much uh, uh, in the debates over Trump. You know, so it's, on the one hand, controversial to even utter the term. But I think it's, you know, there's no way to escape the fact that uh, combining these kinds of policies is really a deep aspect of that tradition. That is, if we understand that fascism, which is a tradition that arose in the 20s and 30s, it was not necessarily uh, Hitl Hitlerite genocide. Uh, that is, fascism arose as a radical right position, a revolutionary right uh, position demanding complete overhaul, uh, drain the swamp, of course, the classic slogan that has been deployed by Donald Trump, but it always and also had a strong left-wing element disciplining capitalism against the market, demanding that the economic uh, system also include those people uh, who were tossed to the side by market policies. That's why they became so strong in the 1930s, uh, and that's why they emerge today. Again, it did not necessarily entail anti-Semitism. Uh, the Italian fascists, uh, until Hitler got more influence over Italy, uh, uh, was, was, was rather uh, not anti-Semitic, nor was it necessarily genocidal. Uh, it, um, uh, it had all of these authoritarian aspects, and um, what happened is that, of course, it became delegitimated after 1945, with many of its supporters by, by the late 1940s, as Hitler is losing the war, lamenting that Hitler has given fascism a bad name. Um, now, fascism, of course, did have a bad name. And here we get to this issue that if you know fascism is back, how to understand that? Because there's, again, no question that, that is policies are um, policies are very are very similar. Let me let me um, point to some classic features of fascism: glorification of the nation. Again, a concept I'll get back to in a moment does not include everyone. It's a very specific kind of concept. It includes those who you say belong to your nation, and exaggeration of its humiliations. So even though there had been a lot of advancement in uh, Kaczynski's Poland. Uh, the, the rhetoric was that it's a place in total ruin, which is exactly like uh, 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 Donald Trump's uh, uh, talk of carnage right, in America. Punishment and or violence promised to enemies of the nation. This cult of executive power, repetition of lack of shame for uh, lies. And at the same time, uh, vengeance on behalf or, or, or you know, commitment, one might say also, uh, to those to helping those who feel and who are disempowered by history and by capitalism, promising economic justice and a new kinds of national identification for those uh, belonging to the nation. So basically what we're dealing with here is that, you know, fascism did get completely, Ill, uh, uh, became illegitimate uh, after the end of World War II. Now here we get to the issue that for about 70 years, right, these kinds of policies are considered just not part of the acceptable political spectrum whatsoever. And in the last few years, it's changed remarkably. 
right? So now that has had a big impact on, 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 on how we talk about it because both in Poland and now in the United States in the last month, you have a lot of people shouting, this is fascism, this is unacceptable. How can you do these things? You know, you're all fascists. And that rhetoric is not working at all, right? And that rhetoric, in fact, drives many of the people who voted for these parties, not because they think they're fascists. And of course, right, neither Trump nor Kaczynski, I mean, they, 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 they themselves say they have nothing to do with it. Although, you know, if you, again, read classic fascism, there's, there's the comparison is, 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 is intimate, right? But so those who just shout, this is fascism, you can't do it, uh, stop, 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 right? That has been the kind of uh, uh, resistance that's been attempted, uh, and that's something that is entirely ineffective, right? Because again, people voted for them for other kinds of issues. So I think what we actually need to do uh, is to calm down the, um, the uh, 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 tone, but at the same time say that, okay, fascism is back. Uh, now, look, personally, and perhaps to many of you here, you know, I think it was a good thing that fascism was off the political agenda for 70 years. Um, uh, now, however, that it's back, we have to say, well, it's back as a, legitimate contender since, since uh, neither peace nor in Trump do they back off on any of these aspects, right? They're very consistent that we're pushing that agenda. So I think you know, what we need now is to, uh, again, not shout that it's legitimate, but rather um, uh, uh, explain that it's back, talk about this other side as the fascist, but not in a way that it's illegitimate. Now, because yelling again that they're fascists are only gonna drive some of those who don't consider themselves fascists into the arms of those who are more explicit about their fascism. So in America, you get someone like uh, Steve Bannon, right, who of course, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was even a notice in the paper the other day about you know, his uh, uh, connections and his writings uh, uh, championing the views of Julius Evola, uh, classic fascist theorist, um, and, uh, uh, and you know, Bannon is a big supporter of that. So the point then is that right now there seems to be a choice between this kind of new policy, um, which of course does not have the genocide and does not have the concentration camps, very big exception but right now uh, those promoting this say that if we don't have genocide and concentration camps and we allow you to protest then none of then we cannot be fascist at all which I think uh, is false and I think we need to get beyond that in any case the point then is that this is the choice that faces us between fascism or that's the other question or what because I think right what the success of this old, new fascism tells us uh, is that the uh, neoliberal era uh, is in uh, a de death crisis, right? That it's unsustainable the way it's been carried out. Um, again, people rejected it in Poland. Uh, there's a lot of rejection of that um, in the United States. Besides Trump, of course, Bernie Sanders came from nowhere to uh, almost win the Democratic nomination. So there's no stable return to the neoliberal politics of the past. Uh, rather, the alternative, must, the alternative to this new fascism must recognize and accept, accept and promote those kind of inclusionary aspects promoted by this radical right uh, without, of course, accepting the uh, 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 political authoritarianism. Now, after World War II, when fascism was discredited, what happened? There was no return to the capitalism of the 1930s, far from it. Uh, there was a new type of capitalism, modern capitalism was called, it was really Keynesian social democratic capitalism with an assumption and assertion of rights of states to intervene, um, uh, accommodation and promotion of strong labor unions uh, to assert their interests. Uh, and right, this social democratic consensus in the post-war period was something that did learn from those lessons of fascism, provided that economic inclusion, 
limited, limited economic liberalism and promoting political liberalism. Because one thing, you know, another slogan we could say that I think makes it easier to remember is that historically we see that, I didn't write this down, but um, too much economic liberalism threatens political liberalism. That is, if there's too much focus on simply this free market, right, then since that marginalizes so many people over time, those people are going to say, we want some radical change, and so they're more apt to support those political illiberals, those authoritarians who say, we will take care of you, we will take care of you now, right? So too much political liberalism challenges, <laughs> economic liberalism challenges political liberalism. That's why the social democratic, the post-war era was so successful for a generation until the mid-1970s or so, right, in limiting the economic liberalism, but maintaining the political liberalism that the Nazis, the fascists, of course, eviscerated. Now, um, so I think the only kind of alternative is one that promotes that. Now, in Poland, there is one, one party that's been trying to do that, the Razem Party, it's called the Together Party, um, uh, which, which has been speaking about these issues, again, very, very much around, talking about issues of economic inclusion, even supporting some of uh, PiS's measures uh, in this regard, at the same time fighting against authoritarianism, against the evisceration of the court, fights against NGOs, changing of the electoral rules. Peace hasn't done that yet, but it will. It's already said before the next elections, change the electoral rules to make it very difficult uh, 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 for them to lose. Um, so are these policies good for the nation? <laughs> well, here, as I said, you know, we get to this idea of what we mean by the nation. Now, in the United States, we're used to the idea that the term the nation is an inclusive term. Uh, politicians who normally uh, uh, deploy that term uh, talk about all citizens, all people who are part of this country. Um, in Poland, like in many other once struggling countries, like in many other places that were once peripheral parts of empires. Poland, of course, didn't exist on the map from 1795 to 1918, was a peripheral part of distant empires. Um, and this idea of nation emerged in Eastern Europe among Poles, like among others, as a very kind of uh, exclusive notion. It concerns only those who are, who are Poles by language, by religion. Uh, and, and it became a very in ex exclusive concept. So nation, nation in, in, in Eastern Europe, in much of Europe, does not at all necessarily include all the people who live in the country. It includes only those of our ethnic group or in Poland, where you don't have ethnic racial differences anymore, you had huge ones before the war, and of course that's what, uh, uh, that's what promoted the quasi-fascist politics they had right before World War II, and the fierce anti-Semitism, anti-Ukrainianism uh, uh, that was prominent there. But since then, under, under communist rule, uh, Poland became ethnically homogeneous. So now when the uh, piece talks about the nation, it also doesn't include many oppositionists. To give one example, a lot of peace supporters refer to uh, Gazeta Wyborcza. This is the main opposition paper, uh, the main liberal newspaper. And they say, they don't say this is the Polish press, Polish opposition press. They say this is the Polish language opposition press. Very big difference. Po it's written in Polish. We grant you that. We can read it. It's Polish. Good Polish, no question about it. But it's not Polish, because to be Polish, in Peace's view, in this view, you have to take certain positions. You cannot talk about the negative aspects of history. Uh, you can't take uh, all these kinds of uh, uh, positions. So we represent Poland and the nation, uh, and the opposition does not. Now here let me problematize that a little in the Polish context because one of the ironies is that historically um, many in the opposition have themselves in the past rejected the idea of the nation. 
uh, as be, that is, they were themselves accustomed to seeing the term used to justify exclusion. They, they noted how in the pre-war period that talk of uh, the nation, of building the Polish nation, was essentially anti-Ukrainian, anti-Semitic, anti-German, uh, 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 anti-toleration. And so many in the liberal opposition uh, have often been very skeptical of the views of the nation. So here's a quote for Donald Tusk, the former prime minister for the last eight years, uh, now the president of the European Council, in 1987, so two years before the fall of uh, uh, the, old, the old regime, during the communist system, uh, it gave, it wrote a piece, responded to questions from uh, a journal. And this is now constantly, piece is constantly referring to this quote from 30, what is that, 30 years ago now. Polishness has abnormality. I cannot resist this painful association. The concept of Polishness invariably, invariably invokes in me this stubborn resistance. Uh, uh, where others speak of men and women, we have to speak of Poles. Where others speak of culture, civilization, and finance, we shout God, honor, and fatherland, always with capital letters. Where others build, love, and die, we fight, rise up, and perish. Polishness often stultifies us, blinds us, leads us into a world of myths. It itself is a myth. Again, in 1987, this makes perfect sense, right? For those who are still fighting to simply get basic democratic rights to be able to develop Poland in a, in a new, modern way. Uh, and just to repeat, we have to be Polish above all and cultivate that myth uh, is not enough. So we represented very much a modernizer, let's, let's, let's uh, uh, change the world. Uh, and and uh, as prime minister, uh, he certainly you know, never said anything like this. He was the representative of Poland, but he understood that Poland's interests, Poland's national interest was to develop uh, to be closer with the European Union, to be part of that world as a whole. Now, that's also one of these issues that uh, uh, aggravates many in peace, and uh, maybe I'll talk about this more in the question period, because those who are feeling economically ex excluded uh, that made the margin of difference for peace's victory, just as we know in the swing states they made the margin of victory for uh, 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 Right, the margin for Trump's victory, uh, they're there, but they're also in Poland, right, those who are simply committed to old style nationalism on ideological grounds, triumph, trumpet the view of the nation in capital letters, where Tusk rejects that. There are plenty of people who will say, no, we'll, we'll do exactly this. That's a group that, of course, cannot be won over. Uh, uh, that's the firm, the firm bastion of the um, uh, 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 peace support. So peace has really three constituent groups supporting them. On the one hand, those ideologically committed to nationalism. On the other, uh, the second group are those uh, uh, committed to uh, classic church Christian values. Uh, interpreted by the Catholic Church. And the third group uh, is, that, is that group that can go back and forth, those who feel economically excluded uh, uh, by neoliberalism, who feel also culturally, culturally excluded by that and need to be won back. So what are some of the lessons? Well, the first uh, it comes follows just from the last point I made about Tusk, the importance of national symbols. So, uh, right, as I say, that quote of Donald Tusk, although he hasn't repeated it in 30 years, continues to haunt him, right? And, and, and peace, people will hold up placards, you know, this is what you said, right? So um, uh, the opposition now has not been falling into that trap. So the Committee to Defend Democracy, which arose soon after uh, peace came to power, goes to demonstrations with, the, with Polish flags uh, in their hands and, and, and doesn't give up that, uh, 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 those symbols uh, too, too easily. Um, second aspect, we clearly see more and more, right, this centrality of independent judiciary and civil service, right? In Poland, where there's, in parliamentary systems, where there's uh, no well, the only chance to resist comes from uh, this independent judiciary. Some countries, historic of, of long-lasting 
uh, uh, duration uh, are often said to be kind of tempered by tradition. So, uh, so in uh, the un United Kingdom, for example, they also don't have a constitutional court as such, uh, but you know they tend to be tempered by tradition. In Poland. Much of uh, Eastern Europe, which has gone through such transformations in the last decades, right, we see this absolute centrality of having independent, professional judiciary and civil service again, which are now, um, which are uh, which are very much on the line uh, today. Um, resistance, opposition must be continual, but done with determination and calmness not with hysteria. Again, I think you know, that has been the response to the opposition who rightfully recognizes that we're facing the kinds of policy combination that has not been seen in many decades. Right? And so their response has been, again, alarm, hysteria. Um, because, though, because that radical classic fascist policy is once again appealing to many people. Simply yelling is not going to do the job, but it doesn't mean that you simply stand on the sideline and say everything's okay. So I think in other words, the way to challenge the normalization of classic fascism is for those opposed to it to kind of normalize it themselves. Not accept it, but simply acknowledge that it's, it's there and, and try to push those who defend these policies into proving that they're not fascists when in fact their policies fit so much closely into it. But again, in a calm way. Resistance unlikely to succeed without plausible solutions for the problems at the root, right? So there's no simple return now to those policies of the past, right? Too many people have been rejecting that. Uh, if you get a short-term turn back, uh, it's likely not to be long-lasting. So, you know, I think uh, uh, for a number of reasons, and, you know, uh, 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 economists talk about this as well, those who talk about cycles in capitalism, many in the economic profession talk about, you know, the end of the uh, uh, neoliberal era, right, as being an, uh, a period that once dealt with some of the contradictions of capitalism. And, 30 years ago helped stabilize capitalism, but now it's no longer able to stabilize it. It's creating new kinds of conflicts. Um, here, learn from the right. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Now this may be kind of surprising for those who know this quote. This is a quote, those exact words, of uh, the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, uh, who in fact died in an Italian fascist prison. Right, arrested uh, by Italian fascism, uh, and um, recognizing himself, writing in jail, uh, prison notebooks, and, and in which in which this this phrase of his was used, uh, that you know he understood the reasons why the right had an advantage right now, and that it wasn't looking good, but at the other hand, maintain optimism, the will. And when I say lessons from the right to do this, because if we stop and think. Look at the amazing strides that have been done since the end of World War II to today. That is, they've restored much of that classic fascist uh, 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 position. And they did so from a point where it was completely off the radar. It was completely unacceptable, right? And really, there have been people who've been durably kind of pushing along, let's maintain ourselves. They also had pessimism of the, of the intellect. This is not going to win anytime soon, but determination, optimism of the will. And so I think as oppositions to these tendencies in Poland, in America, no doubt in France, if as there's a very good chance, though far from for, for or far from foreordained that Marina <laughs> Le Pen will win the presidency later this year. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I, I do think there are important reasons why why this pessimism is warranted right now. Again, those on the left who want to restore some kind of economic inclusion don't very well know how to do it in an era of globalization. Um, uh, so it's difficult, but at the other hand, it doesn't mean that you know, this alternative uh, is eternal, especially since this alternative proposed by the right 
is filled with its own internal contradictions. Can peace really challenge the marketplace when it itself is so dependent on global capital? Can America break from the international uh, arena while still maintaining its hegemony? Will all these kind of exclusions or, you know, the news today of, you know, trying to really round up uh, 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 millions of people and deport them instantaneously, does that lead to an uprising here? What about those people? You know, so it's filled with, with in, 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 internal contradictions, that other side, which is why I don't think it will last uh, eternally, but, you know, I do think, I mean, we see it, uh, and I think for, you know, the next, the next uh, period, 10, 15 years, uh, they probably um, are in the driver's seat. So on that pessimistic note, let me end, and happy to take your questions. Thank you. So, yes, sir. So, um, across Europe, um, we saw a rising xenophobia um, as if the um, decline of the neoliberal era had found its sort of proxy focal point, and, and uh, the right wing populist party across Europe sort of seized on this anti immigrant sentiment. And, um, on my read, that that has led to a rise in support for, for a lot of the, the, the far right parties mm -hmm. in Europe. It doesn't sure. sound from your analysis that the immigration issue was really at play in the months leading up to the election in 2015. So I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts on um, how this um, anxiety around the decline of the neoliberal era manifested itself yep. in, in the political debate. Yeah, no, good question. Look, I, I, I think, you know, all of the, the talk, this anti-immigrant sentiment, I mean, it comes all under the rubric of security, right? A sense of security, a sense of solidarity, which again, have been very strong, we could say, in that post-war period, um, provided on the one hand by aspects of economic inclusion, which have been eroded in the last years, uh, and also, of course, a sense of, uh, you know, security because, you know, the West dominated the world. I mean, when the social democratic con consensus began in 1945, there was still imperialism, right? They controlled other parts of the world. So, of course, you know, one of the changes over those years have been uh, the rise of the others, uh, sometimes called, or the rise of the rest as opposed to the West, right? Globalization and, and, and these other powers. And of course, you know, we know that, uh, uh, that uh, the, starting with the Iranian Revolution of 1978, you had this dramatic new alternative that broke from the dualism of the Cold War that says it's either capitalism or communism, right? By this new alternative that says a pox on both of your houses, right? And we're, and we're talking about, uh, uh, right, religious return, right? Theocracy, uh, which has had a powerful effect in the third world. Um, you know, and has galvanized people who used to be nationalists or Marxists in the third world, right? Many of them have turned to this. Now, how does that impact in the West? Well, of course, uh, you know, it's a part. It's part of that general decline of security. And of course, once you do have these spectacular uh, terrorist uh, acts, which of course we all know are minor in number, and you've all heard the statistics about you know everyone dying in bathrooms or something more than that. But nevertheless, right? It's so spectacular, and uh, and and it's true that that's happening. So you know, in Poland, it's not true that that was absent because even uh, when pe right before peace came to power, was at the height that is in fall 2015 was the height of the immigration crisis. The news every day of of you know the hundreds of thousands crossing the border and then walking hundreds of miles right towards Germany. Um, and although Poland is not on the route, uh, the, the, the government was very strong in saying, we under no circumstances will take refugees. Kaczynski himself used the kind of language that would talk about another connection with fascism, alas, and unfortunately this, this quote was in line with, 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 with you know, Nazi language about Jews, namely saying that they're infested with protozoa and, 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 and germs you know, that'll contaminate us. So you know, again, they need to be physically isolated. So 
you know, this issue of security uh, is um, one of those issues. I also think in the anti-Islamism that you saw in Hungary and in Poland, there was another question. Um, you know, they see themselves as making a big cultural counter-revolution, right? That's one of the aims, not just internally to take power and pursue these policies, but, but, but we, we really want to reverse the uh, culture that was, has been promoted in these last decades. Um, and, um, you know, that, that culture that has promoted more openness and tolerance of course, openness and tolerance were part of the ways that the West in the post-war period helped grow, bringing in workers elsewhere. Um, but you know, th they want to reverse this, and they see themselves as innovators in Europe. So one, I think one of the aspects why they play on this, it's an appeal to, to the concept of whiteness. And often they do talk about being white Europeans as opposed to others. You know, whiteness is not a category normally used in talking about Eastern Europe because whites are basically all there are. Um, but on the other hand, in the context, right, of, of migrants coming and parties in Europe talking about this other, they emerge as we will not let this happen here. We're going to be the last defenders and protectors of uh, whiteness and pureness. So, you know, this idea of there's, there's economic security, insecurity, which they appeal to and which they talked about constantly, right, in their, in their, in their campaign. But it fit well in with this idea of um, uh, 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 physical security. And that alludes, I don't want to get too far afield, but, you know, one of the ways that the new right, this exclusionary right emerges now in the social democratic Nordic countries in Sweden, fin uh, Denmark, Finland, is you have these parties fiercely anti-immigrant, right, but saying we will defend the welfare state, the classic welfare state economic inclusion for us only, for whites only, right? So Poland and Hungary, they say, well, we want to do that for you people, but clearly we can, you know, only do it for whites only, right? And, and these present that, that kind of threat. So they've been able to use that very, very well. Yes, sir. Well, with this piece's attitude towards famous literary <coughs> political figures in Polish history, who weren't 100% Polish, like Kuczynski, Zine David, Zine Rosetia. I mean, you can't claim that they're 100% Polish in their bike ball show of Lithuanian Polish. And the same thing would apply to the Ukrainian. Sure. Person. And how do they regard the contribution of Jewish writers to Polish? Yeah. I mean, do they write the whole thing off? Mo, you know, it's, it's, no. They, they simply don't address those questions specifically. You know, maybe, you know, as a young boy, when I first read about and heard about and, you know, Nazism and fascism and the Aryan race, I was always struck, as probably many might be, like, Hitler doesn't look anything like the classic Aryan, right? He's like anything but. Uh, and many of his lieutenants were were not that that you know person. But at the same time, right, you don't talk about that. You just simply push through. Now, yeah, on all of these others, basically, you know, Bees has been able to um, assert that uh, yeah, they determine really who is acceptable and who not. Uh, so no, they're not distancing themselves. Certainly. You know, not from Pilsudski, although Pilsudski was hated by the right in previous times, uh, 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 they acknowledge Pilsudski. They're more of a fan of Domovsky, who was more the uh, classic, the classic nationalist. Um, and among those other writers, no, they don't necessarily break from them. It's sort of, you know, the way that one of the leading officials, uh, the experts on the part of the judiciary within peace, it's a man by the name of Stanislav uh, Piotrovich, who was in fact a prosecutor in the communist system, right? Now, when the opposition has people who were taking those roles, you know, peace denounces them as, uh, see, that explains this continuation, the continuity with the old system. Um, but they themselves have some of their people and simply say that, no, this person did something else and, and you know, we're not going to take it out on them. So that's some of the ways in which they, you know, seem to, seem to um, 
you know, push in this exclusionary direction, but make all kinds of pragmatic compromises, uh, right? Don't pick a fight where it's not totally necessary. You know, so even for example, you know that picture I showed you of the father taking care of the baby, and that was supposed to be uh, right, not a traditional family. Uh, that was sent by uh, you know, groups very much connected to peace, but peace itself hasn't yet gone that far, right? And and say that you know we don't want any fathers ever ever taking care of the babies. In fact, you know it's hard to find in any. Uh, traditional uh, education uh, uh, or traditional gender roles, you know, a complete ban on uh, uh, paternal care. So, yeah, so, you know, they don't take the bait on all these things, right? So, so they leave themselves that kind of way out. Yes, sir? Um, how, how is uh, peace addressing the issue of international security? Hmm. Inside, you have Russia, and uh, they try to stabilize the situation in Ukraine, they try to make some deals, perhaps with Trump and things like that. It's like, uh, yeah. at the same time, you know, EU and uh, the survival ship of EU, at least it's the uh, highest point of questioning. Uh, we can speak about NATO, but if you really look outside the rhetoric, I'll tell you no American wants to die for both. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if they want it, they already could die to fight ISIS, which they don't want to destroy. So the point is basically Poland is like, like you know, it was sort of protected by NATO when they joined NATO. Right. But right now it's sort of naked. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, do they plan to create nuclear weapons, for instance? Well, smaller countries like Israel have nuclear weapons. Right. Perhaps Poland should create it as well. Right. But is anyone talking about it? Not very much, right? And it and people in the opposition have pointed to that. That is, the previous previous governments, the liberal governments, had a clear view around foreign policy. Again, they had clear view about what the interests of the nation were. They understood it in a more inclusive way, not just honing down on who belongs to us. Uh, and so, previous governments were very much committed to inserting themselves within these international alliances, right? We need protection. We need close relations with Germany and the U.S. And uh, you know, and and uh, 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 yeah, we're going to work on those. Peace denounced them frequently. Denounced Tusk and others for uh, sucking up to Western institutions. Again, that's part of their kind of leftism, uh, right? Some in peace. There are some peace leftists who former Marxists. Uh, who use this anti-colonial rhetoric uh, to support their policies, right? Break away from this vassalism. But what follows from that, they don't really have an answer to that. A lot of belligerent language towards Russia. Um, since they've been in power now in a year and a half, uh, they basically say nothing about Russia, right? Uh, they were always attacking the previous government that you know, the Smolensk plane crash, which I didn't talk about, was a big issue of uh, uh, pieces rise, talk, you know, uh, claiming without any evidence that this was, a, you know, a plot by the Russians to kill their president and the leaders. Again, it's, you know, the absurdity is launched by the, you know, you would have to believe that Poland in 2005 constituted, you know, a, 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 a existential risk to Russia, that Russia would do something that it didn't do even at the height of uh, uh, previous wars. So, you know, it defies logic, but nevertheless, they went along with that. Um, but um, and around, around Russia, they denounced the old government of Tusk for not getting the wreck of the airplane back from Russia, where, you know, and, but peace has done nothing about that since being there, right? They just don't talk about that issue. Germany, they've had very tough, uh, again, talking about, talking bad about Germany. Uh, uh, just about two weeks ago, there was a first kind of m m meeting, Kaczynski and Merkel, um, uh, uh, there may be a slight change to that, but basically they've been isolating themselves from that. And many in the opposition point to exactly that, you know, that you, who are your friends? You don't have friends, especially when you say it's us against the world. You know, if you go back to, you know, that, that exaggeration of Poland's humiliations by others, 
uh, and blaming the rest of the world for it, then they're not really going to be so anxious to defend you. Uh, and we see that there. You know, I think that uh, there's a lot of similarities, of course, of, of this of, of, of peace uh, and in Hungary with, uh, with Putin as well, right? Uh, especially Putin, you know, restoring a strong state after the collapse of Russia in the 1990s, uh, and also using oil money in the two th early first decade of the 21st century to uh, rebuild some cities to provide for the basis of a middle class. Of course, you know, the reliance on oil money has, has been a double-edged sword, so now it's been suffering from that. Um, uh, and also leaving pockets open for opposition, right? Not uh, so in Hungary and in Poland more than in Russia, but somewhat in Russia too, there are those pockets for opponents still to exist. Um, you know, but uh, uh, no, they, they, they haven't been good at establishing any kind of other alliances. Uh, I think it might be possible for um, peace to go more in the direction of Russia uh, along the line of a Nixon goes to China moment, right? Because peace is, of course, determined itself, set itself up as the most anti-Russian party, right? Uncompromising. Uh, but as they're losing allies in the West, and of course Donald Trump being erratic on whether there's any kind of defense of these countries, uh, yeah, one might see movement in that direction. But you know, in terms of in 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 terms of nuclear weapons. Uh, a couple of people have said such thing, but that hasn't been, a, a, you know, accepted by party as a whole. Mostly, I think they don't know what to do about it. I think, you know, they came to power thinking that we can use these institutions to buffer our nationalist a ambitions internally, right? So uh, we can complain about foreign capital. But German and French capital are still going to want to build things in our country because labor is a bit cheaper. Uh, we can rail against exploitation by others, but NATO is still going to defend us, right? Now, as, as uh, the EU erodes in many ways, partly because of Poland's doings, um, and, uh, and of course, as NATO coalition, they are more vulnerable. And uh, no, it's one issue probably the main issue that is really not addressed. Uh, they just say, we have to have strong state, strong leadership, that will get us respect. Everyone else says, well, look, it's not like Kaczynski is, you know, now Poland is, is, is widely admired in the world as a great figure who's restored, you know, made Poland great again. I mean, there's no general consensus about that issue, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's one of the weakest issues and one of the things that the uh, uh, critics uh, can point to and may be able to point to with, with um, some effect in the near future. Yes? Along those developments that you have described, uh, Poland, its economy uh, has absorbed uh, a huge number of Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, this absorption often merges um, exploitation. Could you talk about that? Yeah, sure. Right. Um, look, what you've had in Poland is um, a lot of immigration and emigration in these last decades, right? So about two million, at least two million Poles, well, three million, some have gone back, you know, have, have, have gone, left Poland to go to chiefly the UK and to Ireland, right? Uh, of course, that was an escape valve uh, internally for declining conditions at home. Um, I've done a lot of research in Poland in these small industrial towns that were really flourishing during communist times and then became denuded quickly after, right, because they lost their, uh, they lost their product, they lost their market, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the, the cities collapsed entirely. What did arise in many of these small towns is refurbishing of airports, so you can go from very small cities in Poland and fly directly nonstop to London or to Dublin. Uh, uh, so there's been a big exodus of Poles there. Uh, at the same time, right, we, the cheap labor, desire for cheap labor, and the, and the comparatively worse situation is Ukra in Ukraine has brought uh, many over into Ukraine. Now, most of them, they, they get visas to enter, but not visas to work. 
uh, and they are working. So there's a bit of, there's a good deal of duplicity now in Poland's claims, like lately they keep saying to the European Union that, oh, we're not taking refugees, we're not taking the Islamic refugees, but we're happy to take the Ukrainian refugees. It's not entirely true because most of them are uh, uh, undocumented, we might say, right? Uh, again, not having the right to work, uh, but massive exploitation on that, on that level. Um, you know, so it's uh, 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 been been one of the things that that has kept. Actually, that's worked well uh, for the economy of both the previous government and this government. On that issue, there's really there's really been no change. You know, and uh, I don't think that's about to reverse itself. So, uh, you know, it's it's again something that provides for that cheap labor, very much for that easy exploitation. Uh, and uh, peace doesn't have to take responsibility for poor conditions that they're uh, uh, enduring since, again, they're by definition not part of our nation. Right? So, you know, it's a kind of escape valve in that way as well. Yes? Oh. Locally, I attended a few of the Constitution Day parades downtown here in Chicago. And Constitution Day, a Polish Constitution? Constitution. On November 11th. No, oh, 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 that, oh, yes, of course, not Independence Day, yeah. These were big pro-peace demonstrations. I was wondering, what's the attraction to the Polish community here? It was far removed from yeah. maybe one or two generations separated. Why are they attracted? And I didn't see cool. anything in support of the opposition. I might have looked. look. I don't think I did. Yeah, it's a great question. If uh, the person who invited me was here, I, I know Kinga Kosmala has been involved in this opposition to that, and she would have a better answer than me. I'm not from Chicago. I don't really know, except, you know, and perhaps some of you will have a response to that. But, you know, having known, I've been going to Poland for 40 years now, and obviously, you know, I've met loads of people there and here from, you know, all both sides, you know, I think part of the issue has always been, for those who left a long time ago, there's a certain guilt involved in leaving, right? I left and why did I leave? Interestingly, it's connected with the immigration, immigration issue. Because, you know, when the refugee crisis hit and peace is coming to power, I was in Poland at that time and I was struck by this discourse that starts emerging that many people started saying, you know, that these refugees from Syria, from Iraq, they're not real refugees, they're cowards. What, what are you talking about? Well, if they were real refugees, real men, because there's a lot of young men crossing over, of course they have the best likelihood of surviving and of getting work, but you know, there's a lot of young men coming over. If they were real refugees, they wouldn't have come over. If they resisted, they would have stood and fought uh, fought to the death to liberate their countries from these regimes. And I said to some of those people, I say, that's really interesting what you say. So you actually believe that tens of millions of Poles are cowards uh, for having left Poland uh, during this World War II, during the Solidarity period, you know, because they didn't stay and take up arms against the regime, right? In which case, they of course have no answer to that. But, you know, the issue is that, you know, a lot of people have felt guilty for leaving when especially, uh, you know, after a few years of Stalinism, Poland did not kill any oppositionists, right? And in fact, comparatively, in the, so in the Soviet bloc was one of the um, most tolerant in terms of opposition. But hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, you know, in America until 1989, just like in Cuba until a couple of months ago, anyone coming from those countries because of the Cold War had automatic uh, rights to claim political, refuge, uh, po political refugee status on the basis of being, um, uh, um, you know, uh, persecuted. So. I have to explain it largely in these in these psychological aspects of you know we left and we and we feel a little bad about that and so those who are asserting Polishness above all that we can you know kind of uh, uh, expiate some of our sins by being very supportive of that you know otherwise I I really I really don't know the answer and again you know some of you may 
may have other conjectures on that. Yeah. Yes? Um, are there any, could you kindly comment about plans of economic development of Poland? You know, this is the country yeah. which basically exported its unemployment, starting from 2004. Uh, basically, the issue has been that. And, uh, right. You know, I don't know if there is some way to guarantee the rights. It's, I don't know, they keep talking about talking. But the point is, like, you know, just like, are there new industries created? which I have missed uh, reading the press, or is there entrepreneurship at its peak competing with Israel? Yeah. Like there is nothing like that. It's like a country which, basically, if I think about Poland, and I left in 1982, I can quote, and I don't have really amnesia. I mean, like the Zubrovka and Suhat Lubasa and all those things. Yeah. What does it have to do with creation of anything? You know, it was a country of, of many people left, like, you know, with, like, Abroad and but nothing internally. There's no problem to build yeah. anything. It's like you know, just like yes, foreign companies have subsidiaries. Microsoft moves and takes cheaper labor and whatever. But this is not a role of competing with Microsoft. No. There's nothing we're competing with Facebook. It's just like secondary role of, of doing some processes which can be done cheaper. Yeah, great question. And you know that uh, piece, of course, also criticized previous governments for not creating new kinds of industry and promised it would do the same. Uh, they have a finance minister uh, who talks about this a lot, uh, and he was elevated to the position of vice premier as if to symbolic, as in order to symbolically emphasize that this is important to us. But uh, so far, proposals he's put forth uh, have not gone anywhere. That is, there's still very much this time of consolidating power, defeating the opposition, making sure we can win the next elections, right? So uh, doing, doing all this. And um, also had a really interesting comment. I know a um, businessman there has been quite successful. Um, uh, he was um, a poll who left in 1968, like many did, uh, 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 of Jewish origin, and left uh, with the anti-Semitic purges in 68, 69, lived in Sweden for the next 20 years. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1990, a, a Swedish businessman knew he knew Polish and says, come along with me, I'm going to try to make all these deals in Poland because it's breaking out. And uh, the Swedish businessman didn't have any success. And this guy I knew who didn't consider himself a businessman, he was writing a PhD at the time, realized he had a nose for business and became very big there. Anyway, without telling his biography too much, I mean, he made, he, he, he started um, uh, promoting exchanges of doctors to, into uh, 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 Sweden and Poland and uh, set up a coffee chain, green coffee. He's been very successful. Anyway, my point is that as a successful businessman, a few months ago he told me that he was invited to a, a, a meeting of business people uh, with uh, what, a vice Minister of Finance, uh, who's talking about how we're so supportive of this. But as he said, he stood up and said, look, you know, you don't understand, he said to them and to the others, that all that this policy and this rhetoric, this rhetoric of exclusion and of intolerance of everyone else makes us very poorly positioned to take advantage economically of any success. So you, these kinds of policies that define all immigrants, again, as, as, as uh, treacherous, uh, right, uh, is doing worse for developing Polish ingenuity and Polish business than anything else, right? He said most of the accompanied business people there applauded, right, that, 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 that you can't separate these two, right? So right now they do have on record, they say, yes, yes, we're promoting this, that, and the other thing, but money hasn't gone into that. Again, much more money still has gone into things like, uh, I don't know if I mentioned that, particular thing, but, you know, like uh, they've sent around questionnaires to universities. Uh, tell us the names of people who have been teaching to topics like gender studies. You know, not that we'll fire you the next day, but, um, you know, these people would not be able to get grants. They already, you know, if you, you cannot propose a topic like that and get a grant, that is, you're free to propose the topic, but you're not going to be funded. Uh, uh, journals just last week 
you know, Polish journals, pub, uh, popular in some academic journals, have always been funded by uh, the government, by the state, who's funded a wide variety of them. Uh, but the last batch of those, you know, excluded, uh, um, you know, those kind of critical civil society issues. You know, so you have again this real irony, whereas. I mentioned at the beginning how there were these two periods in which Poland was so important and, and, and galvanized the attention of the world. And in the 1980s, through the Solidarity Movement, it promoted this idea of civil society, right? Of, of, of independent activity, uh, transforming the world, not just by relying on the state, but by engaged public activity of citizens interacting on their own, right? And this became Actually, you know, as a political scientist, I know and saw how this concept, the very term civil society, till the 1980s had not been used in American discourse, social science discourse for a long time. And it, re and it revived, and those theorists of that have all attributed that to the influence of uh, Eastern Europe, right? Um, Kaczynski explicitly, right? you know, has said, we don't talk about civil society here, uh, we talk about the nation. Yeah, społeczeństwo obywatelskie, ale naród, right? So, you know, that's the term. Uh, and, and, you know, civil society is too much of these independent institutions that, by definition, if they're independent, they cannot be relied on to realize the interests of the nation only we can be, right? So there's that marginalization of that. And again, there's complete focus on that and on winning the next elections. Um, uh, on what grounds do they have to develop that? It's really hard to see, right? Just like with their foreign policy, it's really hard to see how it's very stable. You know, I guess these are some of the aspects why I say that the internal contradictions, uh, I think, are very are very big, are very severe, and are going to uh, uh, lead to a lack of consolidation in the long run. Uh, even though you know, right now they're they're feel they're in the driver's seat and probably are for the next few years. Is there any opposition? Is there any political party or individual who presents any? You know, be yeah. More benefit. Let's call it more beneficial economically, because basically I see the equation: more economics, less liberty. Yeah, yeah. This is what you have described. So I'm thinking you cannot do that, you know, by saying all oh, liberties are taken away because it doesn't work. Right. But perhaps you can offer better economics by far. You know, there is. Maybe this I don't know. There is one party, the, the, the former coalition of this named Civic Platform that was in, uh, in government for the last eight years, they split right before the last election. Uh, and one of the groups that emerged from it is called um, Modern. It's a very odd name, Nova Chesna, right? The Modern Party, uh, led by someone who's a kind of classic neoliberal, right? Who, who goes back to let's just talk about the economy and focus on that. And he's got about averages between 10 and 15 percent support. Um, he, but again, it seems pretty clear to me, and I think most other commentators, that that kind of opposition can, can get about that much, but probably not much more, right? That you need to be able to combine that. You need to have uh, right, a, a social program as well, which they explicitly do not. Uh, the civic platform that remained has tried to add on a bit of a social program, but uh, uh, they've had difficulty doing so. And I think also, it's you know, something I said earlier, that one of the interesting parts, again, as a political scientist, I think about this, how difficult it's been in these first years to, um, to, to develop any coherent and consistent challenge to this. It's such a shock to the political system that these parties are advocating such a position, you know, that the opposition, uh, liberal opposition, or even social democratic opposition is for the most part unprepared for it. Uh, and so, you know, they, yeah, they, again, if you're sit calmly and treated as just a normal opposition, which is how peace, and Trump says, hey, we guys won, just get over it. 
And everyone says, well, wait a minute, you won, but you're doing things that nobody else has done. Like, that's really different than before. They say, hey, we won well, de democratically, so it's the same thing. So I think, again, parties should not go along and say, you're just another opposition. On the other hand, if they sh simply shout, you know, the earth is falling, and it's, and it's you know, complete rejection, then the other side could say, if it was comp if if it was if it was this total fascism that you're talking about, you would be in jail or dead, right? So since you're not, it's okay. So again, I, we're still in this position. Again, that's why it's such an urgent question. That's why there are these lessons for the time of Trump, right? Uh, you know, this is something we're going to be facing and talking about for some time to come. In opposition parties, uh, I, opposition is not yet accustomed, familiar with how to deal with it. You know, again, that's why my modest proposal, as it were, is to is to tone down the rhetoric. Well, no, tone down the tone without toning down the rhetoric. That is making clear that this is a formidable, drastic, dramatic, authoritarian uh, uh, um, alternative emerging from the other side. But not just yell and denounce everyone who supported it. Right? Because not everyone who supported it, it did so for those reasons. But again, that goes back to classic fascism. Right? Those who voted for Hitler, again, to take that extreme example, or those who voted for Mussolini, those who voted for the fascist parties, did not think and did not uh, call for all of the policies they were going to do. They saw parties that were talking about their interests. Most people, unlike those who come to a talk like this, or me who think up a talk like this, right, we're more interested in politics uh, than most people, right, who, uh, who vote nevertheless. So, you know, we have to be able to talk to them. And, and uh, you know, I think it is important to know how to do it. And again, you know, that's my modest proposal for beginning to do so, making clear that it is a radical and dangerous alternative, but not yelling and not denouncing those who support it, uh, but uh, simply trying to, you know, force them to deal with the potential consequences and at the same time build an opposition that no longer says, let's just go back to what was, you know. Like, people are right. Why did Hillary Clinton, to take that example, you know, spend the summer talking with all of these uh, um, wealthy billionaires raising a lot of money instead of going one week to one small town or small city and sitting down and talking to people about how, you know, Bernie Sanders did that and again came from nothing to a hair's wisp of winning the nomination, you know? So um, uh, there is that debate going on in the Democratic Party. I guess, you know, uh, I think clearly that those who say you have to take more account of those social concerns are um, absolutely right, but uh, uh, many in the Democratic Party haven't accepted that yet. In Poland, of course, where you don't have a two-party system, you have coalitions and parliamentary system, that's why there's, you know, opportunity for that Razem party to develop and for these other parties, and, you know, they're dealing with that. but. Uh, you know, we're in an early stage and the opposition is still fragmented and unprepared, um, you know, and uh, again, that's why this talk or these topic is all too relevant. And, uh, you know, I think all of us, as we talk with others, be, uh, I mean, political consensus are created, as I always tell my students, you know, just by people's individual ideas and how they express it with others, right? Uh, you know, so I reject both a kind of hysterical view, because I think it alienates others, and I reject also a, 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 a despairing view, you know, let's just, let's just accept it, right? It's got to be something in between, and, um, you know, I think we're not ready for that yet. People are not yet doing that, but, you know, that's what I think we need to do. Well, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much. We can continue this conversation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Thanks.